Well, man, I can't decide if your fro is bigger than Albert's fro up there. Oh, clearly the champion. Clearly the champion. <laughs> Well, today we're going to continue our series, Clickbait, and we are looking at uh, what about 12 celebrities? What did they look like back in high school? You know, uh, today we live in a success culture. We applaud famous achievers, and we put our trust in those with winning track records. We give uh, prestigious awards to the world's most accomplished authors, scientists, and performers. We even wear the fashions of elite designers, and we cheer when our favorite athletes win a title or set a record. But when we put these individuals on a pedestal and print their achievements in bold type, it's easy to forget for all their accomplishments. These successful adults are human like everybody else. And they came into this world like all of us. They toddled and tripped their way into childhood. And they too had to endure those awkward school years. (laughs) You know, some of us, uh, some of the world's most attractive men and women, the ones who many of us want to look like, were once ugly ducklings. Would you believe that this uh, dweeby young fella is none other than Matt Damon, a.k.a. super cool secret agent Jason Bourne? This particular little girl is the Oscar-winning beauty Julia Roberts. Before she was famous, this is what Nicole Kidman looked like. Yikes. I think I dated her. Uh, I'm guessing Dwayne Johnson was called the Soft Rock uh, back when this picture was taken. And you may have caught it earlier in the song, but this is what I look like in high school. That's my ninth grade high school picture. Thank goodness I eventually grew up to look like a typical high schooler. But this is a picture from when I graduated college. So, whew. For a few people, high school's a blast. Maybe you're one of the lucky ones who is homecoming queen or student body president. For many others, high school's remembered tragically as a bad hair day that lasted for four years. I think for most people, that's the mark for the teenage years. Weird peach fuzz growing out of strange places, skin that dashes madly between too oily and bone dry, and when you were a teenager, I bet like me, you possessed a superpower. You were invisible around adults, and unless you opened your mouth, you probably had another skill saying the wrong thing at the perfect moment. And now with apologies to any high school students, uh, I'm going to make a statement that will hardly get an argument. Most teenagers have a lot of growing up to do. When we start handing out important assignments in our culture, it's rare to give them to anyone who's yet to complete 12th grade. There's a reason we have a legal drinking age and age qualifications for renting a car, getting married, or even running for president. Bet you didn't know this, there's a minimum age requirement for using some of those favorite social media platforms. You probably didn't know this because it was in the fine print that none of us read. But you have to be 18 to use YouTube. 18. 17 to use Vine. 14 to have a LinkedIn account. And you must be at least 21 to have an Uber account. So if the world is in general agreement that most teens aren't ready for adult responsibilities, isn't it fascinating that Jesus, in all his wisdom, in trying to turn the Roman Empire upside down, chose to throw out this old idea, as I'm going to propose today, that he turned the world upside down with 12 celebrities. And those 12 celebrities that he called disciples weren't old middle-aged men. They were actually teenagers during the three years they trained with him. That's our clickbait for today. Let's jump in. Let me tell you a little picture. show you a little picture. I think every time you see a, a, a video about Jesus or the Bible... Often the picture is shown as Jesus as this you know, 30, 33-year-old rabbi, which he was, walking down the streets. And who's with him? A bunch of middle-aged men, right? They're all in their 30s, they're all in their 40s. Go ahead and put that first picture up. And this is sort of our idea that the disciples were these middle-aged men. In contrast to that, I want to propose to you that today we're going to see that they were actually more like teenage boys. And Jesus is going to invest in these teenage boys, at least most of them, in a way that allowed them to change the world. Let's pray together and we'll dive in. Father, thank you for the opportunity today to dive into this idea that you see us in our moments of needing potential and needing help, and you work with us in the midst of it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, if you saw the pictures of me, if you didn't come in quite yet, uh, we showed some bad pictures of me from high school. Uh, here's a couple of me. You might see some of the potential of what I do today. You would have seen me as a performer. Even though I couldn't sing, I won a lip sync contest. Uh, I was a track star. That's me falling asleep in the track van on the way to a, a triple jump competition. Or doing some acting or some SNL skits we used to write. 
But God reached in and he saw these teenagers with untapped potential, incredible potential to change the world, and yet with self-centeredness and anger issues and fear issues and says, I want to use these people to change the world. And what we're going to find is, if this is true, and I'll try and build the case, that Jesus is as much leading them as he is parenting them. And Jesus comes across a principle in his leadership, a principle in his parenting, so to speak, that is so tangible, that is so practical, that applies about any relationship of mentoring you might have. And here's the principle. The more I like the way you live your life, the more I'm going to trust you to lead my life. And if our kids look to us as parents and say, you know what, I like, mom and dad, how you're living your life. Don't agree with every decision you make, but in general, I like the kind of relationship you have. I like the kind of wisdom you have. I like the the tenderness you have. I like the courage you have. I like the perseverance you have. The more I like the way you, my mentor, my parents, my influencer, the more I like the way you're living your life, the more I'm going to trust you to lead my life. So whether you're a boss, whether you're a parent, whether you're a coach, Those that we're leading are looking to us and looking at not just what we say, not what we believe, but what we do. What kind of life are we living? So today we're going to look at three parenting skills. You could easily call them leadership skills that Jesus used in transforming the world through a group of celebrities who are actually mostly teenagers. My hope is that we're going to learn how we can have credibility in our parenting, credibility in our leading, that we can not only get people to obey what we're asking, but really to want them to emulate our lives. Parenting skill number one, or leadership skill number one, is that Jesus was a master at using humor in his interactions. In fact, he could use humor to teach these teenage guys how to handle both responsibility and freedom, but without flaunting it. Now, this particular humorous passage actually shows us why I think that these disciples were teenagers. One day, a guy walks into town, uh, a priest or scribe, and says, Hey, i got a question, Jesus, for you. Why haven't you paid the temple tax? Now, this is not like the IRS Roman tax. This isn't the government tax. This is a specific tax paid to the religious group, the temple. If you were a Jewish rabbi, if you were a Jewish follower, you paid a temple tax. And so this man shows up, says to Peter, why doesn't your master pay the temple tax? So Peter walks over to Jesus. Peter was married, so he probably was the one who wasn't a teenager. And he says, hey, Jesus, this guy wants to know if we're going to pay the temple tax. And Jesus says, well, i got a question for you. The temple tax is a tax on, on the worship center that goes to my father. My father is the one the money ultimately is going to. And I'm the son of the father. So i got a question. Who pays taxes in the kingdom? Strangers or sons? Peter's like, well, strangers, right? If, if you're the heir, if you're the son of the royal family, you don't pay. He's like, yeah, I could pay, but ultimately goes to my dad anyway. But tell you what, let's have some fun with this. We, 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 we want to be responsible, even though ultimately the money goes back to my dad anyway. Tell you what we'll do. I want you to go down. You're a fisherman. I want you to go... Throw the net in and grab the first fish you catch. He throws the net in, catches his first fish. He pulls it out. He goes, and you're going to pull out of that fish our tax money. What? So he throws in the the, uh, the net, pulls up a fish, and sure enough, out of this fish, he reaches in and pulls out a shekel. And Jesus is like, we're going to pay our taxes this morning with a fish money. And you can just imagine the smell of this thing having been to that fish. And Jesus starts sort of smiling to himself. But what's interesting is that the shekel, why only a shekel if he's got 12 disciples with him? Well, back in the book of uh, Exodus, it said that this particular temple tax was paid for half a shekel each for anyone 20 and older. So he only has one shekel, that's two payments for two adults, half for Peter and half for Jesus. It seems to imply, and Jesus also will say later, he refers to his disciples as little ones often, that everyone else, all the other disciples, are less than 20. They're teenagers. And so Jesus, using this humorous example, sort of shows, hey, we really don't have to pay because this is sort of money that goes to my father, but we're going to be responsible. And I love this phrase, the first phrase up here. He says, nevertheless, lest we offend them, 
I want to teach you guys that sometimes you have the right to do something. But even though you have the right to do something and the right to be free, we don't want to offend some people. So we'll have a little fun with this, but we are going to pay the temple tax, even though we're not doing it. And using their own examples in their own world, Jesus is beginning to teach, teaching his disciples the importance of responsibility and freedom at the same time. But Jesus uses humor constantly. Now, often, you know, as a parent or as a leader, I pull out discipline, I pull out management tools. And one of the last things I think to use to manage or direct people is humor. But Jesus uses it constantly. Jesus uses humor to redirect people. Is a great passage. He's preaching in the Sermon on the Mount, and he's going to use humor to redirect somebody. Because isn't it true that it's hard for you and me to see our own issues? I mean, if I said right now, give me the top ten things your spouse needs to work on. Man, you could write those ten down. If I said, could you give me the ten things you need to work on? Well, I don't think I have ten. Right? So Jesus would often use humor to help us see that we don't see our own blind spots. So he's preaching to a group one day, and he uses humor to do that. He says, now isn't it true? Why is it that you look for the speck in your brother's eye? That guy's so judgmental. That guy's such a problem. Oh my goodness, look at how gossipy they are. Well, that person, I can't believe they're wearing that. Don't we all have a tendency to look at the speck, just a little bitty speck in our brother's eye, when you don't consider the plank, the big old plank in your own eye? And the, the audience starts laughing, isn't that true? And as you work with employees, as you work with kids, as you train new people, it is amazing how lacking we all are in self-awareness. We can criticize everybody else's speck and miss the gigantic plank. And so Jesus uses humor to get people to sort of laugh at themselves and go, yeah, okay, that is true of me. I remember a friend of mine, his name's Peter, he was a worked in the Shetland Islands in the oil industry, and he had a daughter who just really started getting defiant. And she just had this mean look. So they asked her to do something, and she'd be like, just, you don't dare try and tell me what to do. You're not my boss and all that. And they were going to pull out the discipline. They tried that for a while. They tried the you know, consequence thing. He decided to try humor. Every time somebody came over, they'd say, hey, hey, Fiona, show them your angry face. I'm not going to show them my... That's perfect! And we all, oh, that's a great face. And I tell you, it was funny because she was using this to say, I'm not going to do it. And pretty soon she found out she was a stand-up comedian. She started laughing about the fact that her angry face and this father used humor to redirect this anger issue where she started to actually enter in. I don't know if you saw the news story about a, a month ago. There was a dad who decided to use humor because his daughter was posting all these sexy selfies. So instead of... Coming down hard, he could have done that, that would have been appropriate, giving consequences, taking phones away. He decided to try humor to redirect her. He took a picture of himself in the exact same poses. <laughs> What's amazing is she actually thought, saw it, thought it funny enough that she retweeted it on both Instagram and on her page. So sometimes... We should reach in and use humor in a way that maybe we haven't before. And Jesus does that. He uses humor to redirect. He uses humor to help people admit their faults. He goes on in speaking to his disciples in a group one day in uh, the Sermon on the Mount, and he says this. He says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and you don't consider the plank in your own eye? How in the world are you going to get the speck out of your brother's eye when you've got a big old timber in your own eye? Guys, we gotta, we got to learn to admit our own faults before we see the faults in others. And this again calls us back as leaders and as parents to we got a model first. How often do we apologize to our kids? How often do we own our disrespect toward them? How often do we own our lack of kindness toward our employees, toward our grandchildren? You see, we got to go first. We're good at giving lectures about what you should do, but they're seeing what we're doing. Are we living a life that is so attractive that they're trusting us to lead their life. I have my kids do this a profile. They're both uh, you know, one's in college, both in college actually, um, taking college courses at least. So I have them go through this leadership profile, which sort of sets them up for what their career might be. It's called the Berkman. All of our staff do it. And so we're on our way back from Cedar Point one day, and it's Javen, Sierra, and I. And as we're driving in the car, I said, "Hey, let's look at the Berkman profile together, and let me tell you some of the weaknesses this says about my profile." Oh, we can't wait to hear that, Dad. This says that under stress, 
I have a tendency to get very impatient. Oh, yeah, that's exactly you, Dad. I know, I know, I know that my normal behavior, I, I can be a little impatient, but under stress, I'm really impatient. Where do you guys see that in me? And they're telling every story, and I'm laughing. And, and I said, but it also says that I'm a really good planner. And Javen blurts out, oh, my goodness, yes. Dad, you have always thought of everything in your head in advance. And Sierra bursts out laughing. I'm like, man, that is me, isn't it? I said, and that comes across sometimes like I don't want your feedback. They're like, yeah, I said, man, I do. The staff tells me that all the time, too. Man, I'm so sorry. I do want your feedback. I just do think about stuff a lot. And it also says that when I get really stressed, I can get busy just for the sake of busy. And they're like, you wear us out. And from there, I was able to say, well, let's look at your profiles. What are some of the things that under stress you do? And we got a chance to laugh at each other and talk about some of the weaknesses we had and stress things. But because I was able to admit and have a sense of humor about my own problems, inadequacies, you know, character flaws, it created an environment where they could too. And humor does that. Third, we, humor allows you to make surrender easier. Instead of always coming sort of will to will, you know, you better submit or, or what, and there's times for that. Humor allows teachability and surrender and admitting you're wrong. You want to teach your kids and teach your employees, it's a good thing to admit you're wrong. It's a secret to marriage, it's a secret to life. And Jesus would use humor... To allow disciples, this particular one, um, Nathaniel. Nathaniel hears about Jesus from a buddy of his. And he says, well, where is he from anyway? Well, he's from Nazareth. <laughs> Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It would be like me telling you that the Messiah that you've heard about your whole life growing up Catholic or growing up in synagogue is coming from Newtown, Ohio. Really? Newtown, the God of the universe, he chose Newtown? He shows up having really said this pretty disrespectful, offensive thing about Jesus and his family and his, his, his you know, area he grew up. And notice how Jesus doesn't get all bent out of shape. He says, you know what? He saw Nathaniel coming toward him and he says, Behold an Israelite in whom there's no deceit. I like that about you. I like that you don't beat around the bush. I like that you speak your mind. I appreciate the joke about Nazareth. It's not really known for being a big town. And in the midst of that, immediately, instead of having a fight about how important Nazareth is, using humor, laughing at the joke, stepping into that moment, Nathaniel goes, wow, everybody usually gets offended by this kind of thing. I had a next-door neighbor who was like that. He said, Chad, I wasn't really a religious guy, and I met you for about six months, and I tried everything to get you mad. I made fun of the Christians, I made fun of the Bible, I made fun of Jesus, I quoted Richard Dawkins, and I noticed that you didn't react the way most religious people do. And I was interested in that. You sort of laughed at some of the idiosyncrasies. You agreed with me on some of the observations about religious people. Humor can bring defenses down. One of my favorite examples of this is a comedian singer. His name's Tim Hawkins. And he's a, a traveling comedian but also a songwriter. And he wrote a song about how he uses humor and songwriting to get attention to his teenagers. Let's watch. I just started to communicate with music to my kids. They don't listen to me talking anymore. I just use their songs and get my point across. We're at the mall the other day. They're just begging me for an iPhone for an hour. I finally said, dude, I'm not going to buy you an iPhone. Because you asked for it like you need one. You don't. I'm not going to buy you an iPhone. You're insane. to 
to be. Your abuses and excuses are getting old. You'll stay at home. You'll stay at home. You better quit all that complaining. Don't want to hear another sound. If I hear any more whining, I'm going to turn the car around. You got a little television and you had enough to eat. If you don't change your disposition, I'm going to leave you on the street. So I'm waiting for your attitude to change. I keep on waiting for your attitude to change. You say that I ain't fair. I guess that would matter if I care. So I keep on waiting. <laughs> well, I think there's something powerful about not being sarcastic or disrespectful, but there's something about bringing humor into circumstances, because there's one thing about teenagers is it's fun to push your parents' buttons. And when you get all angry and all powered up, at some level, it's fun. Look what I can do to my parents. But if you can, even doing out, giving out consequences, do it with, with a sense of humor and do it with, it's going to happen, and, you know, this is a real consequence, but without sort of always going to the, to the angry uh, tool, always going to the control tool, to bring humor into that. The second leadership lesson we see in Jesus is his ability to use challenge. Jesus constantly took this group of teenage ragtag group and put them in challenging circumstances. And you know this if you're a coach. You know this as a leader. If you want people to move to the next level, you've got to inject challenge into their life. And when you bring challenge into people's life, you teach them how to handle a lot of things, but specifically emotion. One of the greatest things we all need is know how to handle fear and anger. And many of us were not taught well how to handle fear and anger. We were said, don't talk like that. Okay, but how do I do it? No one took the time to really say, how do you process anger in appropriate ways? How do you feel the fear and be courageous anyway? And one of the roles as leaders, one of the roles as parents, is to go a little slower in our parenting and help process not what you don't do, that's important, but also what do you do when you're disappointed? What do you do? What is a way to disagree agreeably? What is a way that when you don't like my decision? I had this conversation with my son. I said, buddy, it's okay that you disagree with me. Just not that way. Here's how you can disagree with me, and I'll listen. I was trying to say, here's the appropriate way, because one day you're going to have a boss that you disagree with, I promise you. And you're going to need to know how to appropriately dissent, how to appropriately tell why you didn't like something happened. And so we have an incredible role as parents to use challenge in our kids' life and our employees' life to deal with emotions, specifically fear and anger. And Jesus did this constantly. Jesus brings his group of disciples one day, and he says he made them get in the boat. And again, I believe Jesus was God, so I believe he knew in advance a storm was coming. But if you don't believe that, that's okay. Look at the leadership principle. He makes them get into the boat. He sends them out into a storm. A group of teenagers and Peter into a storm. They go out to the other side. Evening came. The boat's in the middle of the sea. And Jesus alone, he's watching them. How they're going to handle this challenge. How they're going to handle this situation. And as he watches, he sees they are straining. They are trying. They're, and these are trained fishermen their whole life. I mean, they've been trained and apprenticed to be fishermen, and they cannot outrow this challenge in the storm. And so Jesus, having made them get into this challenging circumstance, injecting more and more fear into their life, brings some humor into the challenge. It says in Mark that Jesus decides to walk on water. To which you say, Chad, this is why I don't believe the Bible is true. This is why I don't believe Jesus. Is. Come on. He's got walking on water. Well, think about this for a second. If the Bible's true, and if Jesus claimed to be God, and if he is God, shouldn't God be able to walk on water? Wouldn't it be a bigger problem if this, if this book claimed to be God in the flesh and he couldn't do anything? So for me, that's sort of my take. But there's stuff to dig in there. But Jesus, if he is God, he's walking on water. But here's the humor. He walks on by, and these guys are like, oh my goodness, we're going to die! We're going to die! We're going to die! And it says that Jesus walked on by, and he would have passed them by. He's walking so fast. See that phrase? He would have passed them by. And as he's walking by, they look over. There's a ghost! What's going on there? And Jesus, having put them in this challenging circumstance to bring out fear, gives them a lesson on fear. Guys, here's how you handle fear. Be of good cheer. I've overcome this. 
And Peter, in fact, takes an additional challenge. He goes, listen, if you can do that, I want to do that. If you can say, call to me and I'll step out of the boat. And Peter gets the opportunity to have additional challenge. Of Jesus, at least for a few minutes, he also is walking on water because he took the challenge Jesus had for him. And then Jesus gives him a lesson. Why did you take your eyes off me and on the circumstances around you? This is the secret to dealing with fear in your life. Don't look at all the circumstances. Keep your eyes focused on me when these fearful thoughts and feelings come your way. When my kids are little, I love boating and, and jet skiing. And so I've had my kids uh, in the tube or on the jet ski since they were about nine months, much to my wife's improved prayer life. And uh, so we're in the tube, my daughter and I, at nine months. And as we get older, and I remember as the kids got older, they'd be sitting in the tube with me. We're going faster and faster. And I'd say, all right, it's now time for us to, to fall out of the tube. Oh, no, 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 water, you know, going back and forth. And I said, now, I'm going to hold you, and we're going to fall out together. Dad, please don't. Please don't. Please don't. No, that's what we're going to do. Because I want to teach you how to fall with Dad. So later on, you'll learn how to fall by yourself. Dad, I don't want to do that. You're terrible Dad, terrible Dad, terrible Dad. Counseling, counseling, years of counseling coming. And so we'd fall out. Oh, I was terrible. I'm alive. I'm alive. And my kids love swimming because what? I injected fear. And the same thing is true. This year I sent both my kids to Israel for a 125-mile hike through 115-degree temperatures in Israel to be where Jesus was and to feel that experience and, and to train for that. And these kind of challenging circumstances spiritually help our kids face fear. Going to Israel this time of year and everybody's saying, you're a terrible parent sending your kids to the Middle East. Guys, we're not going to be controlled by fear. We're going to discern, we're going to check, but we're not going to live our life controlled by fear. And this is going to teach you about that, being in the land Jesus walked. So however you do it, how do we inject challenge into our lives like that? In fact, even as we adopted Quinn seven years ago, we're sitting in the hot tub one day because we tell a lot of stories sitting in the hot tub and and Quinn was, I think, about four or five months. I got him in the hot tub, and Sierra and Javen are with me, and they're teenagers at the time. And I said, hold on just a second. And I blow in Quinn's face. And he closed his eyes, and I dunk him underwater. Push. Push. Dad, what are you doing? We're going to call 411 kids. I said, I got a friend of mine who teaches infant uh, swimming lessons, and this is how you teach swimming lessons. You blow in the face. And it trains them to hold their breath. You put them underwater. And that's how I trained you guys to know how to enjoy the water. I blew in your faces and dunked you. And they're like, you're a terrible parent, Dad. (laughs) You guys know why you love water so much now? Because I started training you early. And so part of what we do as leaders is we bring appropriate amounts of challenge to prepare people. Before we were this building, we were at um, Cincinnati Country Day for about 10 years and when we were there one time, we had a guy came and spoke. His name was Joel Rosenberg. Powerful story. He was an infant that was, you know, relatively normal, and an 18-wheeler crashed into the back of their car at a toll booth, and he had third-degree burns over all of his body. He had to go through hundreds of surgeries. He spoke one day at our church, and he shared how at age, whatever he was, six, his body now was completely regrafted with skin. And the pain he went through and the humiliation he went through as a elementary school, as a junior high, or as a high school student. I said, how did your parents help you deal with that? You seem like you've got a lot of joy for somebody who could be very bitter. He said, I'll tell you exactly what they did. My parents, during those elementary years, took me to the mall and sat with me for hours in the mall. As people came by and gawked at me and stared at me, and they taught me how to wave and say, hi, I'm Joel. Hi, I'm Joel. And to interact with people. And that challenge taught me how to love people, how to not internalize what they were saying. And I'm now able to stand against and be okay with myself despite my appearance because of how my parents challenged me by putting in a circumstance where I literally for hours had people gawking at me when I was young. I thought, man, I never would have thought to do that. But how do you prepare a son who's been burned over 90% of his body for a world of ridicule? Well, Jesus not only used challenge to help his kids deal with fear, but also how to deal with anger. He had two disciples, James and John, and apparently they had a pretty big anger problem. Which again, one of the greatest things we can help teach our kids and ourselves really is how to handle anger. How to model, hey, dad got angry the other day. It was inappropriate how I said this. I want to own that. I'm modeling how to own. I want to apologize specifically for that part. You can't teach this. You have to model this. And once you model it, you say, now, let me show you. What Dad just did, that's what you want to do. There's something powerful about that. Well, apparently James and John, again, imagine these teenage guys, they're they're, uh, 
fishermen. They're used to blowing up all over the place. And so Jesus, one of the things he does to sort of help remind them that they got an anger issue is he gives them a nickname. He calls James and John the sons of thunder. Hey, guys, sons of thunder, come on over here. And they like this, sons of thunder. It was sort of a good manly nickname, but also a reminder that they really need to work on their anger. And Jesus uses challenge because they got this nickname, Sons of Thunder, in a very unusual way. Jesus purposely takes his disciples to a challenging circumstance. He says, today, guys, we're going to go hang out with the Samaritans. Doesn't mean anything to us. The Samaritans were a group of people who were politically had a different alignment than, than the disciples. They religiously had different beliefs than the disciples. There was a huge racial divide between the Samaritans and the, and, the, and the Jews. And Jesus purposely took these teenagers out of their comfort zone, out of their insulated life, and put them in a circumstance that would challenge all of their bigotry, all of their hypocrisy, all their preconceived ideas. Politically, religiously, and racially. So they show up. Jesus is speaking to the Samaritans about the hope of God and about God's plan for their life. And the people, the Samaritans, do not like what they hear because they are equally racially uh, bigoted against the Jews and this Jewish rabbi named Jesus. So they pretty much kick off their feet to Jesus and say, get out of here. Now, James and John love Jesus. They are loyal friends. They are men's men. They are it's like the warriors you want at the front of the pack. And they look at the Samaritans, having just rejected Jesus, and they say, God, you, Jesus, you want us to do something about this? How about we call down fire and have God burn that place up? And Jesus kind of smiles. He's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Guys, the Son of Man, that's his name for himself, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Those people who spit on me, those people who just mocked me, those people who have different beliefs than me, those people who have different politics than me, those people who have a different viewpoint than me, I didn't come to destroy them. I came to deliver them, to rescue them, to love them, to forgive them. So guys, let's not call down the fire. In fact, let's talk about your anger. Why are you so angry? I'm going to die for people like that. In fact, you are people like that. The same anger problem you have is the same anger problem they had. And Jesus uses these cross-cultural experiences, taking people outside their insulated arenas to teach us. And isn't that what we need in our culture today? Don't we need more of us who can show tolerance and love toward people who have a difference of opinion politically or religiously? Isn't it the arrogance and the lack of humility that is saturating our culture? What if we were known as a people? What if we were known as a family that, yes, we have very strong core beliefs we believe in politically, that we believe in religiously? I'm not asking you to compromise that. But what if the way we communicated those, what if the way we interacted challenged our, our preconceptions? What if it showed what humility looked like? And what in the midst of that, you admitted, man, I really get angry when I hear about that. I really have a bad attitude when that happens. I'm really struggling with learning how to love somebody who thinks that way. Wouldn't we model something that's attractive? And again, Jesus did that and then gave them the two nicknames, the Sons of Thunder. They were willing to call down fire to burn up the people I came to die for. But guys, I respect your loyalty. I like a piece of that. Let's just figure out how to handle our anger in the midst of it. Jackie Robinson was a classic example of that in history. I love the uh, movie uh, 42. Because in 42, you see the role of a coach. And one of the greatest things we do as coaches, as we do as mentors, is that we help challenge those we lead on how to handle our anger. If you haven't seen the movie, let me show you a quick clip. And look at how the coach specifically put a challenging circumstance in place that gave Jackie a chance to wrestle with how anger is appropriately expressed. Let's watch. And I love the way this coach was willing to step into the circumstance and say, listen, you've got to have the courage not to express your anger at time. And Jackie Robinson says, hey, listen, you give me a number and I'll give you the guts. I'll have the guts to not get angry. I'll have the guts that when I have the right to get angry, to instead use humor and say, I'll duck. And so this coach was able to put a very challenging time in history together, but to speak words into this kid's life in such a way that he was able to handle his anger. And that's one of the greatest roles we have as parents, is to learn how to deal with our own anger. If you saw the story last month, but right in the middle of the whole controversy with Black Lives Matter and Blue Lives Matter in Dallas was a powerful story that got missed 
by many of us. I barely caught it myself. And that was a, a guy in Black Lives Matter was marching through the streets, and he realized that the police that were protecting him were not allowed to go home until he was done. So he purposely made his route longer. Because he hated these guys and because he had such strong opinions, he purposely went a couple more turns, a couple more blocks, and as he was making his way, antagonizing the police, they kept a good attitude, they didn't say anything, and then the story came to a head, because he made a turn toward a place where there was a shooter, and a shooter tried to shoot the Black Lives protester. And as he did, one of these police officers jumped in front of the Black Lives protester who had just been mocking him and spitting on him and saying you know, horrible things about him. And this police officer took a bullet for the guy who had been screaming at him and making his day worse. It didn't change his political ideology, but it was striking to him. He went, oh, my goodness. Maybe the stereotypes I thought, this guy just took a bullet for me. Maybe what I've been taught and maybe what I think isn't what I think it is. And Jesus came into the world to say the same thing. I'm willing to take a bullet for you. Even if you've hated me, even if you've ignored me, if you've said, hey, the whole God thing is a crutch. And then you begin to really explore the story and leadership of Jesus and you say, wow, if it is true, what kind of a leader is this? What kind of a parent would this be? What kind of a a warrior is this who's willing to not just dive in front of for a worthy cause, but to, to put himself in line of a bullet to somebody who is a traitor who spits upon him. It's powerful. Which brings us to our last leadership lesson. And that's the general principle that Jesus knew that modeling was the way you pave for influence. You model your way or you use modeling to pave the way to influence and one of the greatest things we can do before we give lectures, before we give speeches, and we're all, we all do way probably too much of that, we need to ask, am I modeling the life that's going to pave the way to influence? So parenting is always looking in the mirror. Leadership is always looking in the mirror before I look at who I'm leading. Steve uh, DeVore started a company called CyberVision, and it was based on the idea of modeling. One day he was watching a bowling tournament, and as he's watching the bowling tournament, he, he's sort of watching how they're doing the legs, and he's like, I think I could do that. And as he kept watching for a couple hours, he's like, I think I got this down. Having never bowled before, he went to a bowling alley that afternoon, and having watched the video, sure enough, he got a bowling out, ball out, and just imitating what he saw, nine strikes in a row, 278 he got that day. He said, you know what, I think people learn best by what they see. And he started this company called CyberVision that has made now over $250 million in revenue, all based on the science, the neuroscience, of how we imitate what we see better than what we hear. Here's what it says uh, in that article. I love this quote. He says, we learn skill acquisition, how to handle fear, how to handle our anger. Learning from role models. And these programs result in $250 million in worldwide sales. The rabbinic teaching of having a rabbi where people followed you, it wasn't just like you handed them beliefs. You lived a life and you followed a rabbi because you wanted to live the same kind of life the rabbi had. Even Paul, who was very antagonistic toward Christianity, he has an encounter with Jesus and decides to follow Jesus because he's never seen this kind of love for your enemies. He's never seen this kind of courage in facing fear. And Jesus will will have a rabbi or follower named Paul who will then have a group of followers as well. And he will articulate this principle. He'll say, imitate me as I also imitate Christ. Now, are there beliefs involved? Sure. But he doesn't say believe like me as I believe like Christ. He says, imitate me. I'm going to model a living I'm going to model a kindness. I'm going to model a self-control. And you can see in me, and when I don't do it, I'm going to own it and say, hey, I was off mark there. God, help me, empower me, awaken me. But imitate me as I imitate Christ. Now, isn't that a challenge? Doesn't that put parenting or leadership in a whole new role? Not just I tell you what to do. But can we really say, imitate me as I'm imitating the things I say I believe? John Wooden is known as a coach who's had incredible influence and incredible winnings. But every man who was under his leadership as a coach spoke of him like a father, 
someone whose life was so attractive that though he taught us and though he led us to incredible successes, what I really saw in him is the kind of man I wanted to be. A reporter was interviewing John Wooden. I think this is in his book, uh, They Call Me Coach. On the 21st of every month, he pulls out a piece of paper and he writes a love note to his best friend, his special girl. He writes it, he seals it up, and he walks it into his bedroom. And on a pillow, sitting next to his pillow in bed, he unties a ribbon. And he places this love note on top of a stack of love notes that he puts there on the 21st of each month. And he ties it back. You see, his wife has been gone now for 15 years. But he still writes her and woos her on the 21st of each month. He still sleeps on his side of the bed with his own pillow at night. And the men who followed his leadership as a coach said the way he loves his wife before and after she died, I've just never seen love like that. The way he leads with both courage and conviction and yet with also a kind of tenderness and strength. I've never seen this mixture. I've seen sort of narcissism and I've seen weakness, but I've never seen strength and kindness placed together. I want this kind of life. I would trust somebody like that to lead my life. Often when I'm interacting with my kids, I'll ask that very question. I'll say, listen, we're going to have a tough conversation here, but I I want to start by asking you this. Is dad living the kind of life you would want? (laughs) What percentage of the way I interact with mom, the way I've handled uh, our life, what percentage of my life would you want to imitate? I was talking to my son about this a couple years ago, about a year ago, and he says, "Uh, probably 70%. I'll take that. (laughs) All right, well, in the 70%, I want you to trust that you may disagree with me in this 30% here, but I want you to trust my heart. I want the best for you. We might disagree here. I'm willing to hear your side, but I want you to trust me that there's skills involved in getting the things, the kind of relationships that we're talking about. And what I'm appealing to and what I want to ask us to all appeal to is this, with your kids, with your grandkids, with people you influence, with people, your colleagues, whoever you're with, is you want to give a demeanor out that says that the people watching you, watching you can say, I like the way you live your life. And because of that, I'm going to trust you to give influence to lead my life. So as the band comes out, here's our takeaway today. I think that often we need to be an example before we give an example. I'm so quick to give examples. You should do this. You should do this. Here's a lecture here. Here's a speech here. I'm so quick to give examples. But what if instead we said, I need to this fall look in the mirror and say, God, I need to be an example. There's some ways I speak about my husband very disrespectfully. There's ways which I stopped wooing my wife years ago. I can't even tell you the last time we went on a date night. My teenagers haven't seen us go on a date. I don't even think they they think that we like each other. I need to forgive. I need to go to some counseling. I need to get some things right. I need to deal with my own anger. I got to deal with my own insensitivities. I am just, I can't help my kids deal with fear because I'm constantly scared. What would it look like for us to say, I want to take the ultimate example of Jesus, invite him into my life, into my heart, into my decisions, and say, God, I want more what you had. I want to be able to face fears. I want to be able to face emotions. I want to handle fear in a way that it doesn't control me. I want to be able to challenge myself. I want to be able to laugh and not take myself so seriously. This week, I want you to think to yourself, instead of always giving an example to those you lead, ask yourself, how can I be an example? Are you the first to apologize? Do you tell your kids, you should respect me when you talk to me? And yet, do you talk to them in a disrespectful way when you're doing it? I know I have. Do you talk about how important kindness is while you're talking cruelly to them? I know I've caught myself doing that. And the kids pick up. Our teenagers, our students pick up on that hypocrisy. What if even when we're giving harsh consequences, we do it kindly and with humility? I might be wrong here, but here's what I'm seeing. See, the rabbinic teaching of leadership was always about having a group of people follow you who said, I want the life you have. I want to walk like you. I want to talk like you. I want to forgive like you. I want to pray like you. I want to, I want to have the kind of joy you have. And so the song of the disciples, the song of a person who follows the leadership style of Jesus is a lot like the song of Baloo. Where we begin to look to Jesus and we hope that our kids can look to us and says, I want that. I want to walk like you. I want to talk like you. I want to live the life that you called me to.
Uh, let me close in prayer today. And maybe you're like me, man, any parenting talk is like, God, I need help. And we can just pray that prayer. God, help us be better leaders. God, we need a, a model worthy of imitating. And Father, you changed the world with seemingly a group of teenagers in just three short years of leadership. So Father, we ask for your help. Maybe today as you came and you want to ask specifically, say, God, I need your wisdom for a circumstance I'm facing. Maybe you're facing fear and you're saying, God, I need some courage. God, we just ask you to give courage to people facing difficult circumstances this morning. For many of us, we've been hurt really bad. God, I'd ask you to give those folks an unconditional love you have for family members who disagree politically, different tensions from the past, Father. God, we want the kind of peace and joy that you have in us. And we just ask, Father, that you would not only bring us forgiveness, but begin to lead our lives. That we'd live the kind of life that's worthy of following. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here today. If you came prepared to give, there's some offering boxes on your way out. If you're new to the church, we'd love to say hi. Put a name with a face. Third door on your left is the hearth room. Thanks again.